Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. But if conditions continue to get bad and we sort of start looking like we're going into a bear market, then the entire term structure picks up and options become more expensive across maturities. And so there the market is saying effectively, we want to price heightened risk um, over longer horizons. And so you basically get stages in the process. Now. Uh, if the market does quiet down and there's a reversal and realized ball comes down, then the short end starts dropping again. The long end remains elevated until finally the cycle repeats. We have stages in where risk is repriced. And the way I thought about it in the book that I wrote and various speeches that I, I blab on about this um, is that if that is the case, if that volatility cycle is fairly uh, sequentially predictable. You might not be able to predict what happens, but you can predict, predict the order. Mm-hmm. The right strategy for hedging should involve rotating from one type of hedge to another as the surface changes. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to have with us today the author of The Second Leg Down which I was sad to learn isn't about an athlete who loses his legs and goes on to compete in the Olympics, but instead everyone's favorite dinnertime topic, options. We have Hari Krishnan with us today, who's exactly the person I would want at the front of the lecture hall if I was taking a course on option pricing and volatility dynamics during market crashes with that great sounding voice and soothing cadence when explaining very complex topics. So welcome, Hari. Thank you very much. What do you think of my uh, course title, Option Pricing and Volatility Dynamics During Market Crashes? Well, that's a mouthful. (laughs) It is. I'm not sure I can deliver on that, but... uh, Uh, Should we pitch that to a college to offer some students virtually? Yes, but I'm going to make the recommendation that you teach that course. (laughs) I've had my fill with university life, so... Well, that's what I was going to ask. Have you ever been in front of the classroom like that? Uh, I have. I have, and it's, it's a challenge because some people are trying too hard to impress and the others are falling asleep. So um, it's a bit of a, it's a tough crowd. Among the students? So wh- where was that? Where did you teach? I took for one semester as an adjunct at the University of Chicago. Okay, know it. And I've done the odd lecture here and there, and that's about it. Okay, so it was never a profession, really? No, no, no. You, you do not teach, right? Those who can't do teach, those those who can't teach do. Does that work or no? I love it. Yeah. You, I think you do both. Um, so oh, where, you, so where are you joining us from? You're usually in New York, but you're been a little COVID retreat. I am in a beach shack, for lack of a better word, in Duxbury, Massachusetts. Okay, is that the Cape or no? Sort of. Uh, Smack in, be- smack dab in between Boston and the Cape. It's right on the coast. All right, nice. It's about yeah. to start getting nasty with some nor- nor'easters coming in there, right? Well, that's always the fear, and I haven't. We haven't had our generator serviced, so um, I think I need to do some hedging there. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And outside of uh, writing books and running hedge products for investors. You're also a hobby jogging marathon traveler. What does that mean exactly? Well, I used to trade, uh, SoftGen used to be our main prime broker when I was in London. And uh, I had a friend who was into marathoning and he was also into finding the best hotels that were close to the finish of the marathon. (laughs) He'd just sort of hang out, drink some beer and uh, eat really well. And the food and drink never tasted as good 
is at the end of a marathon. Maybe that's too much punishment to take on the way, but we did several European marathons, not earth shattering times, you know, I think I was running in the mid to high 320s, but it was a great time going out there, uh, getting nervous before the race and then really enjoying our food at the end. Mid 320, that's good, I'd take it. Um, it's okay, yeah. And they were only European, have you done them back in the States? I haven't done anything, I haven't run any of the big marathons in the US, no. You're, you're retired. Um, Not for now, yeah. Yeah, so, so give us a little background on uh, how you got into this crazy world of options and you mentioned London and Sockgen, and so give us a little personal background. Yeah, well, I've been around the block and um, so I have a PhD in chaos theory, which we could talk about over a beer or something, but I'll yeah. up there. Then I started working in um, the option space. Basically, I worked for a market making firm that wanted to establish an off floor presence. And so basically what we did was we developed models that allowed them to lay off the risk in individual option positions, options positions using index options so they wouldn't have to unwind intraday. And so it was basically looking at the correlation between implied vol, implied volatility, for individual stocks versus indices. That's a thorny topic, but right, I so got they'd have and a bunch of Microsoft to hedge and you would tell them like, okay, we need to do X index puts in order to do that or buy the X number of index futures in order to hedge that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, typically we did options versus options. Okay. And so I might be different from some of your guests, especially guests who have a lot of sell side experience. Um, we think a lot about Delta one hedging, you know, hedging using futures or the underlying I never really focused on that, but you know, that's a, that's a really thorny topic as well. When that's, everyone wants to talk about that right now with the gamma is driving prices higher, driving prices lower. I've, I've been trying to get on some current market maker or dealer that and see like, is that what's actually happening or not? It seems a little too simplistic of a explanation to me. Um, well, it is. It is actually. Um, the nice thing about it though, is that, you know, as I've been in this space long, you know, over time, as I've been in the markets for a longer period of time, I've realized how important positioning is. And, you know, the two forms of risk that I've always looked at were credits and positioning. I kind of learned that when I was doing global macro in London, which is kind of another add on to my bio. But, you know, if I had to go back and look at 2008 versus today, 2008 was a credit problem. 2020, aside from the huge exogenous shock, which I'm sure you can get other experts to talk about, has been a real issue of positioning. And so some of the stuff, you know, the squeeze metric stuff or the overload of single name calls that dealers may have been short based on client demand, uh, which forced them to hedge, that's been one issue. Clearly, that's been an issue. Has it been the only issue problem we lost? Yeah. Dynamics are very complex. And do you, do you feel there's an unlimited supply of dealer supply on those options? It seems that is a missing piece, too. I'm just like, yeah, the dealers will just sell retail as many options as they desire. Um, they'll sell a lot out of price. I mean... Yeah. There will be an adjustment in the skew as a function of that. And the, the skew adjustment isn't just because, say, Tesla has had some big returns historically. It's also because the flow is so heavy on, let's say, on Tesla or some other name, some other tech name, that dealers have to jack up the implied vol numbers that they quote to uh, at least collect a, a fat risk premium for taking on the added risk. So to a degree, Yes, I mean, you can create as many contracts as you want, but there, there are natural limits to how much supply is really, really available. Right, got it. So sorry, I derailed your bio there. So you're, you're in London, you're market making option desk. Um, oh, well, then I did global macro for eight years. I ran a, an FX strategy. I ran hedging overlays, and I also ran a diversified absolute return strategy. So I did that for 
nine years. And I had the classic issue that many of us face where we have a very large sticky investor who turns out not to be all that sticky yeah. seven or eight years. And so um, at some point I moved back with my family to the US, partly for a lifestyle change and got back into an options focused way of doing it. So the way I'm trying to hit people nowadays is to say, well, look, uh, I'm someone who can help in terms of interpreting the ma macro perspective in certain very specific ways. I don't cover everything. I'm not a pundit, not a media personality per se, but also someone who knows the intricacies of trading options from the buy side. So that's kind of where I'm trying to hit people. I don't think you should be hitting people at all, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> That's yeah. why I strike them hard, you know? Right. right. And so there's some news, right? You just recently joined a new firm? Yes. I mean, um, I have known the folks at SCT for a long time. Um, and given that my existing firm that um, Bob Darty decided to basically move on and do something else, um, I've taken over his business and then plugged it into the infrastructure of a more well-established, operationally sound hedge fund. So I continue to run an independent business line, but within a larger hedge fund. And, um, you know, I hate to use too much corporate speak, but there's some good synergies there. Some good synergies. Good. Yeah, some, some fine synergies where um, they are experts in machine learning. They've been doing it for over 20 years. And they are well aware of the strengths and weaknesses of ML. Um, they have a, an honest approach where they say the real danger in machine learning is that the algorithms get too greedy. They start latching onto what's been going on recently and they're vulnerable to a sharp shift in sentiments. Yep. You know, like a jump in the regime. And uh, that's exactly what I try to do with some of the hedging strategies that I've got to account for that. I just saw today some zero hedge post and they had a screenshot of JP Morgan's algo on the vol space of like dollar vols cheap and this is expensive and buy this, sell this. It made me cringe for a second of like, this, this is a little worrisome, but then I was like, that's fine. Get, get more and more into that space. Cause I think the humans might have a edge there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, humans are pretty good at saying, I don't know what's happened, but something has changed. Yeah. Machines are less good. I mean, the old speech that I used to hear that I think is pretty valid is machines might be more emotionless, but that has some negative attributes too. A machine doesn't worry about trading a million lots instead of a hundred. Yeah. And we'll start sweating if they, you know, they trade the wrong size or they feel the pain of a position going against them. And in a way that's a good response. Um, yeah. They won't know if they get turned off. Right. They don't, they don't know they can get fired. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so in SCTs there in New York? Yep. They're on, uh, they're in Greenwich Village. So yeah. I wonder, I'm curious to see how this all shakes out and whether these hedge funds in New York all bail on the expensive real estate and have everyone remote and see what that looks like. But we're seeing. Yeah, that's a great more. question. Um, you know, it's really a question of also how important culture is. Does culture breed more success at the trading desk? I really don't know. Yeah. Um, back in the day, people were assumed that was the case. In the same way, people assumed that the variations in volume on the trading floor was an important signal of liquidity and things like that. That's all changed. It remains to be seen how this will, uh, this will evolve. The, uh, yeah, I was speaking with a, um, I'm going to forget where he works, but it's one of the big uh, mutual fund or asset managers in Chicago. He was a buddy and he was saying that that's what they're most worried about, the culture. How do you bring in the new people, get them plugged into the culture that they built up? Um, like, well, we'll see. Over Zoom. Over Zoom. Wow. Yeah. Doesn't work. Doesn't work as well. Um, yeah. And then I mean, I have I've done a couple, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I've done a couple of Zoom happy hours. That does not work. No, that was a big thing right in the beginning, right? I don't think I've done one since April, <laughs> but they were like two, three a week in the beginning. Um, 
So I was about to say, I have to ask on the name and that being a child of the 70s of the Hare Krishna uh, cult, would you call it? Religious movement. I don't know if it's a cult, but any relation there? What's what's going on there? Just coincidence? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Well, first of all, I'll say I have nothing to do with the movement or cult or whatever. Cult's probably too strong. Let's just call them a movement. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's a matter of perspective. Um, I've never been involved in it. I don't know much about it. Um, I've, I'm speaking a little off piste, but I've never been one in favor of conversion into any religion. And um, really the origin of my name is there are not that many traditional South Indian names for people of my caste. There are probably five or 10 with various variations and they're the names of gods, you know, traditional okay. do gods. And Krishna is, or Krishna is one of those gods, yeah. one of the, one of the important ones. And so, my first name and my last name are very traditional names. It's a bit like what people in India say: um, no one ever has the name Wolf or Clint or Cliff. All the names have religious meanings, whether you like it or not. I mean, it's just tradition, and that's about it, really. And, and you know, it's funny because as I was telling you before the the call. I was born around the time of Woodstock, and my parents weren't really hippies. Um, they were blissfully unaware of the, uh, not the ridicule, but the difficulty it would cause me in my early years. But, you know, I saw no need to change it. It's, uh, it sticks in people's mind, and should finance go south on me, as I've told other people, I can always shave my head and use my soothing voice, hopefully. Yeah. And, uh, you know, make, make podcasts about inner peace and serenity. Done. I'd, I'd listen to at least one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, sorry if that was insensitive, but I was curious. So I, I needed to know. So let's get into your strategy a bit. Um, a lot of us in the investing world are worried quite simply about protecting our portfolios from a market crisis. I'll use air quotes there. Um, but it seems you don't really see a market crisis as a singularity, you kind of see it as having different stages and profiles. Um, yeah. So yeah, tell us what you see as these stages and how your strategy deals with those different uh, looks, so to speak. Okay, well, you know, there's an economic cycle that people, people talk about, there's a credit cycle. And you know, as people are increasingly become aware of, um, there's a volatility cycle as well. And the vol cycle, you can start it at the, in the late stages of a bull market where investors are complacent. And when investors are complacent, the prices of options are, are low. The premia are small. And the reason they're small is because people don't really feel they need to buy insurance over any horizon. So short dated options are relatively cheap. Long dated options are cheap. And the skew isn't that steep in terms of points. It might be in percentage terms because at the money vol is so low, but it's not particularly steep in absolute terms. Now, as things get worse, if there's a crack in the market, let's say a little flash crash, and I'll just use equities for now, equity indices, because it's common fodder for most people. The first thing that happens is the short end of the vol surface picks up. The investors are now saying, oh, there is some risk in the short term, but we're not going to adjust our risk estimates for a long horizon. Yeah, and short end, you mean short term? Right. Yeah, you know, uh, options with a month to go, yeah. two months to go, something like that, or further in. But if conditions continue to get bad and we sort of start looking like we're going into a bear market, then the entire term structure picks up and options become more expensive across maturities. And so there the market is saying, effectively, we want to price heightened risk um, over longer horizons. And so you basically get stages in the process. Now, uh, if the market does quiet down and there's a reversal and realized fall comes down, then the short end starts dropping again. The long end remains elevated until finally the cycle repeats. So you have stages in where risk is repriced. And 
the way I thought about it in the book that I wrote and various speeches that I, you know, I blab on about this, um, is that if that is the case, if that volatility cycle is fairly uh, sequentially predictable, you might not be able to predict what happens, but you can predict, predict the order. Mm -hmm. The right strategy for hedging should involve rotating from one type of hedge to another as the surface changes. So if all options are cheap, go out and buy some long dated ones and sit and wait. Like a, a game where you collect some you, you get some investors to come in and you say, bear with me, I'm going to buy two-year options, three-year options, whatever. And kind I'm going to okay. Universa Caleb model, would you say? Yeah, Universa probably does some of that. Uh, 36 South specializes in that. Yeah. Um, and it's basically a game where they're saying volatility is cheap from a valuation perspective. So why not buy it? in a setup where you, your vega divided by theta ratio is pretty high. In other words, every day that goes by, you don't lose much in time decay, but for every point that risk is repriced up, you get a big bang for the buck. Yeah, makes sense. And then people will say, well, okay, that's, that's nice, but how do you take profits? You can get in nice and quietly, nicely and quietly, but how do you take profits? In my view, over time evolved to one where I basically argued that you don't want to be taking profits where you say, here, client, one day you're hedged, and the next day you're not hedged. Yeah. You just have to roll with this unless the client wants to do that. And a little better way to put that might be, or for my brain at least, would be how do you monetize it, right? Like taking yeah, profits absolutely. seems like you have a profit motive, but if this is a hedge, you have a kind of a different motive of it's supposed to be covering some piece of a, another piece of the portfolio that I need to monetize the insurance. Right, you don't, your insurance, you mentioned, you're uh, generating your hurricane insurance, you don't have to decide when to monetize it, right? You get paid out if there's a problem, or if not, you don't. Correct, whereas these things can lose value quickly too. Very quickly, right. Very quickly, yeah. And yeah, monetization is the right word. And so basically, the client may have various triggers for monetizing hedges, which is based on what they're doing in the rest of their portfolio, that's fine. But assuming that you're hedging all the time um, and you don't have those sorts of external constraints, what can you do? And my argument was basically, why not rotate from one type of hedge to another type so that you always have some downside protection in place, but you're not overpaying for stuff that has richened you know, by a factor of 10 or something. So if you buy a 10 delta put at 10 bucks and it goes to 110, 100, whatever, uh, probably at some point it's no longer offering good value as a hedge. Either because implied vol has gone up so much, or you really don't have any convexity left in the position. It's just trading like a futures contract or something. So basically the way I thought about it was why not show what the best hedge is, at least based on the combination of experience and some tests, given the regime. And on the put side, also you have a zero bound, right? Like it can't go below zero. Like in theory, you can only have the, the put can only go up as much as the uh, zero bound, right? As much as you would make if it went to zero. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, crude oil, people will pull that yeah, they would argue out, out of the hat. But, but yes, in general, that's absolutely true. Uh, sorry, I broke you off. So you have this monetization, then what do you roll into next? Some kind of a spread. So, um, you know, if, if the skew gets very steep at the short end, you might want to buy put spreads or, or even put ratio spreads if the skew is very steep, where you're um, putting on a defensive position. Uh, you've got bounded risk, at least in the context of your entire hedging portfolio, but you're also monetizing some value out of the skew. So if the market doesn't race down from the point you put the trade on, you're actually building a downside protective strategy that where time is more on your side. And speak through a few of those terms there. So the skew you're talking about in that case, which one's the which one's more expensive that's causing that skew? Well, typically, uh, again, I'll focus on equity indices to keep yep. it easy for now. Uh, when the S&P 500 or whatever sells off, 
typically the implied volatility for out of the money options rises more quickly and more radically than the implied vol for at the money options. Now, if you believe that the speed of the sell-off will not be maintained at that rate, then you're well served to buy some puts that are closer to at the money and sell some puts that are further away simply because even though the puts you're buying might be a little more expensive than they were, the puts you're selling are much more expensive than they were. So from a relative value standpoint, you've got a little bit of edge in the trade, but you're still expressing a downside view. All right. And if, that, if it's wrong, if it accelerates out of that move, if it gets faster, you're, you're, only, you want, you're not going to lose an unbounded amount. You still only have that difference in the spread, right? Correct. Yeah, I mean, I'm not get, suggesting you go in and you buy one at the money put and sell three out of the monies. That's right. a really different trade. Right, right. Um, we, I've seen that one get taken to the cleaners. Um, more on the upside than the downside, but. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I digress. Uh, okay, so what's next? So that skew, skew is high. You're going to sell those spread, or you're going to, you're basically buying spreads, right? It's still a net debit. Yeah, it's still a net debit. Yeah, so you're buying that spread. So you're long protection, and you're basically just trying to skim, all, skim off a little bit of edge from selling the skew, but you're building a downside protective structure. Then if conditions get even worse, it becomes more difficult. Basically, what you have to do is either trade delta one or go into very short-dated gamma hedges. I've skipped a few intermediate steps, but those are the main ones. So why, what are short data gamma hedges? Well, you can buy things like weekly options. Weekly options are very expensive from a time decay standpoint, as, as many of your viewers will know. Uh, if you try and plot theta against time to maturity for a fixed delta option, the theta tends to be very rapid close to expiration. But the good thing about these sorts of options is that you're not really paying up for implied volatility, even though it's spiked. You're more, you're more paying a fixed cost to have a well-defined downside protective strategy in place over a short horizon. That's a mouthful. Basically, what I'm saying is you're not paying up for implied vol when people are afraid. You don't have long dated protection, but you get tons of implied convexity if the market shanks from there. Well, it's kind of like rates, right? Like if the curve is flat, go shorten your duration. Because basically you don't, you don't know what's gonna happen, so get into the short end of the curve and, and live to fight another day. Um, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great example, yeah. yeah. And delta one just meaning you would go outright short. You future. chase the move, you're the, you yeah. try and chase downside momentum in a disciplined way. Usually that's a systematic strategy, at least in the modern age, but it basically relies upon looking for what effectively amount to breakouts on the downside, where the signal to noise ratio isn't too bad. I mean, if you're thinking in kind of filtering or statistical terms, typically when you're looking for breakouts on the up or downside across markets, you're looking for setups where um, the quality of the breakout is high. So there isn't too much choppiness going in. Now, in risk-off regimes, you tend to get a lot of choppiness. So there are various things you have to do to try and minimize uh, the risk of being taken to the cleaners if there's a squeeze. But at the right, same time, you're the down move. Couldn't you argue that the, uh, the implied vol is there in the short futures trade as well? It's just there in the range of the trade and the, right, you... If you had a systematic strategy, the stops would probably need to be wider because there'd be a lot of noise on the opening range or whatnot. Like, so exactly. I could argue that that volatility is still there. Um, but I guess it's not a sunk cost. It's just a kind of an opportunity cost. Whereas if you're right. buying the puts with that high IV, it's, it's a sunk cost. You don't get it back. Yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Sunk costs for some reason. I mean, I mean for obvious reasons, but... But you're right, there is an implied cost to having a wide stop and then having the stop taken out um, in a market with high intraday vol. Right, so, and that, yeah, that delta one just kind of scares me because you could also have, and you see this at bottoms especially, right? Like it might rip higher three, four, 5% someday 
and then the next week it goes another 10% lower, but you were going to get, you're going to take a lot of that big rip higher loss. But I get what you're saying. It has to be very structured and very uh, asymmetric in the amount it can make versus the amount it can lose. But seems seems a little problem. And is that actually part of your strategy or is that just no. theory? I've the never market? done that piece. I've only done weekly options and I've done weekly options. Um, I hate to sort of shoot myself in the foot here, but <laughs> I had this idea where um, this was not originally mine, but at my old firm, we were talking about how some people sort of call you up when they're in dire straits with the rest of their portfolio. Maybe they've allocated to some hedge funds or lockups or whatever, and they're very worried about mark to market losses or just permanent losses. And so they want you to hedge at the final moment. What can you do? And so we sort of thought, well, we're kind of like people who go around in an ambulance we realize we can't give people the best hedge, but we try and figure out what we can do that isn't too expensive. We'll block out the downside. And weekly options used to feature in that strategy. So in other words, if there were some liquidity mismatches between when an investor could get out and the risk they'd be exposed to in the meantime and so on, we go into the shorter dated expirations and try and find highly convex trades that would at least protect them if the market went down significantly from there. So you're not, this wasn't pure window dressing. This was ac actually served a function. It did. It's not the best job though. I mean, the reason I said I'm shooting myself in the foot is because the core of this business, I hate to put it crassly, is running a sustainable business with recurring revenue. And to just wait until somebody pulls you up on the back phone. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, That's tough. It's a business that no one else did, probably because no one else wanted to do it, but it was also quite an interesting one. Right. Well, you'd be the ultimate poker player of like a, a leather ass, as they call it, right? Just sitting around for years and years waiting for that phone to ring. Then you're in high demand, right? <laughs> so you're waiting for the right hand, but it might take a while to get that hand. Uh, so that's interesting. So that, But would that be part of the actual strategy as it exists today, the, the Delta One futures? Just to block out, you know, just to sort of create um, uh, highly convex outcomes if the market is ripping, ripping down. Uh, and the basic idea there is that there is some statistical evidence uh, that supports doing this in certain setups. And I'll give you the intuition first, which is that, you know, a lot of people say that, um, you know, markets, it's good to buy the dips. And that's generally true in, in, uh, in the average case. No. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the danger is if the market goes down, let's say 10% intra week, it could really melt down in the next few days. The odds of a, a very significant liquidation actually increase because people can sequentially get flushed out of the market. And there is a lot of statistical evidence that suggests that markets have the fattest tails over horizons of a week or less. Hmm. And so if you're seeing a fat tail sort of dynamic emerge, buying a weekly option at a fixed cost, probably a sunk cost, but um, not necessarily, is a good way to play it. And I sort of think that the markets don't really understand that because I've tested it. And even though Weekly options have steeper skews and higher implied vols. I don't think actually in general that the markets adjust enough to it. Uh, they don't realize how fat the tails really are over short horizons. And, uh, you know, this is one of the early things that was done in this field called econophysics, where people would just tabulate returns. And so they take like a series of prices for natural gas or the S&P or 10 years, 10 year notes or whatever, the futures or whatever. And they would say, well, let's slice up the prices into one minute intervals, 10 minute intervals, one hour intervals, one day, two days, and so on out to weeks and months. And they basically built a different distribution each time. And they found the tails were fattest relative to the standard deviation. So they normalized these distributions for short horizon price action. Like down, like all the way across the time frame, down to the minute, or was in this yeah. hourly or daily or weekly? 
One minute you get tons of four plus standard deviation moves. I think anyone who's say traded bond futures will have seen that. Yeah. Mega moves on macro announcements or liquidations or whatever, risk off events uh, quite often. Um, for equities, it's a little less common, but the same pattern persists where um, the instant, the frequency of high standard deviation moves, especially down for equities, is much higher than, than oh, over short horizons than it is over, say, monthly horizons, where the so, returns actually look pretty normal. So that seems to make sense, right? Like the longer the time frame, the it's going to smooth out more. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. So the shorter the time frame, the more apt you are to have just a run of, you know, in statistics speak, you're going to have a, a run of bad luck, a run of you're flipping the coin, you're going to have a run of tails, so to speak, versus yeah. on the whole 10,000 flips, you're going to see it smoothed out. Uh, which also made me think, you think we'll ever see like daily or hourly options for that, right? If, if that plays out, <laughs> the exchanges will be like, hey, oh, look God. at all the volume we got with weeklies. Let's, let's uh, offer up some dailies, see what happens. Well, once a week, you do get a daily one. Yeah, true. <laughs> right. and a, and a <laughs> so they are out there, but just not every day. I mean, I suppose you could set the flex options pretty, pretty variably too, but I, I don't know if you'd find a market for that. So let's, let's talk a little, we just came through kind of a real time test of your thesis here and of your book and, and what's going on. So how did it play out as you expected? Any different pieces? Did we actually see a second leg or was that kind of just a one legged monster there? What are your thoughts on all that? Well, since I wrote the first book, some things have changed and that makes the book a little bit dated in one or two ways. Generally, I think thesis is still very valid, but something that I've noticed since 2015, let's say, but more prevalent, it's been more prevalent since 2018, has been the risk of the, of the VIX spiking um, pretty, by a large amount from a low level. It used to be that you didn't get 10 point spikes from a handle of 15. Which right. Was. I mean, right. I know February, all, all, all spike. Yeah, I know there was a flash crash in 2010 where that sort of thing happened, but things like the Volmageddon in February 2018. Even um, that, it started to creep, it creeped up, crept up a few points before the big spike. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. But it was, the handle was below 20 when it just blew, blew yeah. out. And we had the same thing here, where um, the VIX wasn't very high in Feb. And then just blew out completely going into March. Um, and so this makes life a little bit more difficult from the standpoint of looking at hedges sequentially. Um, the other problem with the, the other thing that's changed in the markets quite a bit, although it hasn't happened as much this go around, has been the tendency for the VIX to get slammed or volatility to get slammed as soon as things settle down. There would be, would be a scramble for people to short ball as soon as they thought the coast was clear. And you could look at something like the half-life of volatility across markets, and it had clearly shrunk. So in other words, you said, let's measure the spikes in the VIX or the TY VIX before it got discontinued or a currency VIX. And then let's see how long it takes to go down from the peak to 50% of the way from the initial level to the peak. And that is much shorter than it used to be, at least until this go around. Right. I think this people are expecting it to snap back a lot quicker in April and May. It did. And in other markets, it did kind of come down more. Yeah. In treasuries, if you look at the move index, it's trading at a very low level now. Um, it's just equities seemed, credit spreads have come in quite a bit. Equities seem to be the, the outlier there. Um, and the, the other thing that's quite interesting about now Again, I don't want to focus too much on the negative in terms of predictability is that as others have, come, have, have remarked, I'm sure people on your show have and you have as well, there's a strange kink in the um, term structure volatility with a huge loading in October, November, uh, October, November for probably based around the election, but almost certainly, but 
that's pretty unusual too. Usually yeah. the curves are either upward sloping or downward sloping. Some of our guests have said it's based on a contested election, not just who wins it, but whether or not it gets verified or not. Yeah, that's a, gr that's a great insight. But if that were strictly the case, if everybody believed that, then uh, Dak and Janval should be higher than they are as well, because yeah. contested election means continued uncertainty into the further out months. In yeah, and I think Chris Cole, when Twitter was coming back with that exact point of like, hey, that, that doesn't make sense and it would be elevated. He's actually saying if there is, that's all way underpriced. Um, yeah, well, it has actually ratcheted up a little bit, but yes, yes, he's right. Yeah, we've seen Oct kind of come down in the back months go up, much to the chagrin of a lot of Volar guys that we work with, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, so be it. Um, but the other things have sort of held true. The skew's gotten steeper. The uh, correlation of vol across markets was very high, which means that in Feb and March, it didn't matter where you hedged, you would have made a huge return. You didn't need to be a genius then. Uh, if you if you still had assets and you were still loaded in your positions and weren't getting cues, no matter what you had on, you'd probably make a huge return. So in, in terms of your thesis, Jan and Feb uh, option, vol was cheap, so to speak. So you were just buying out of the money puts. Um, yeah. Then March and April, explain March and April. So it got, when would you have per your thesis? Let's not talk actual trades, but. For your I'd say early March before the low in the market, I would have been rotating into spreads. I would say in, at the end of the first week. So I would have missed the full power of week two. So when we were down 15 or 20, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah by, that, by that point, the skew was pretty steep. So I would have been trading spreads at that point, but the spreads could have been pretty wide. And there still would have been gains to be made. Uh, probably by mid to late March, I would have been in uh, sort of broken flies and things like that. So I would have lost money moving forward through that, but at a much slower rate than people who didn't monetize their hedges. Uh, explain a broken fly for people who think that's a zipper. <laughs> it's a zipper as well. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, you can think of a, um, a broken, well, how do I explain it without being too technical? Yeah, well, we got a butterfly, so it's... Yeah, so you've got a butterfly, which is, uh, you. Bu let's say you buy one at the money put, you sell two somewhat out of the money puts, and you cover all the downside risk by buying an equally spaced away out of the money put. So you might buy one of the, uh, one put at the spot price, sell two that are 5% below, and buy one that's 10% below. For a broken fly, the spacing is not equal. Got it, yeah. Basically what you're doing is you're taking as much as you can from the skew, but you're imposing the constraint that you wanna make money all the way down. So you make some amount of money all the way down by buying that far out of the money put a little closer than you otherwise would, uh, just to make sure that you have a true, true hedge. Um, but at the same time, you're trying to get it, squeeze as much out of the skew as you can. So those sorts of trades would have been attractive at that point, uh, but they would have been very wide. You know, they wouldn't have been zero, five, minus five and minus 10. They might've been zero minus 10, minus 20, or minus 15 type of edges if they were broken. Uh, you know, so that there's a lot of space on the downside. Why do you think investors are still you know, in that March period, is it just panic? It's just fear, right? Like, why are they so willing to pay up for those options when they, at some point it's just a, a losing bet, right? Like at a VIX of 80, is the market really going to get more volatile from there? In theory, no. Right. But people operate under so many constraints and it just takes one prime broker to panic. Uh, um, and to one, you know, one senior risk manager at a major PB to panic and say, blow it all out. I don't care what it costs. And people just have to unwind. They, they, they're not able to sort of hang in there by trading a spread around the position or cutting by 10%. They just have to buy vol at whatever level. I mean, there used to be a, an idea that I had, which it's a bit like the, 
no negative price idea for futures, which said that, well, the VIX can never go above, say, 150. Because if it went up and down, limit up or limit down every other day, realized vol could never get much higher than 150. So you would have to be a seller around that. Yeah. In 2008, if you looked at the implied correlation of all the stocks in the S&P 100, let's say, which can be derived from the relative level of implied vol for the index versus the average implied vols for the stocks in the index, you could wind up, you, there was a time when you wound up with an average implied correlation above 100%, simply because the market was clamoring so much for just slapping on index protection, macro level protection. Yeah. These absurdities can come when people are just forced to cut risk. Is there, is there a flip side to that, that the people aren't able to add risk at those same po points, right? There's people who want to sell into that volatility, yeah. but maybe they're risk constrained by whoever's in control of their risk book, or they just don't purely don't have enough capital to put it on in size. That's a great point. I mean, it's a one-sided market when that happens. Yeah, but, but not necessarily just because of fear, but because of other economic factors as well. Yes. Um, so a point, everything we're talking about here, and these people are buying that up to do a, a hedge. Like, how do you conceptualize and how did you get into this world of direct hedges versus like you were in a global macro firm of like, no, just add this piece and it's non-correlated and it should do differently in a crisis. How do you view those, that difference? Well, I mean, I think there are three ways to hedge. One is to say, um, um, I'm going to pay a fixed amount of premium every year and provide something like fire insurance on people's houses, you know, where there's no real edge in the strategy, but people know what they're getting going in. And if it's run efficiently and well, um, there won't be any unpleasant surprises. The second thing you can try and do is to say, well, I'm really a hedge fund that specializes in downside protection, trust me, I'll do what I do. I've done it before and I'll do it again. That may give maximum flexibility in terms of cutting costs, but it also creates a, an open-ended question as to what is really being achieved with the hedge. And the third thing is the other area that I actually do. So I don't do number two, but I do one and three, which is to say, how, close, how closely can I come to replicating a volatility index like the VIX while minimizing the carry costs associated with that? So I do direct hedging and I also do volatility replication. Those are the two different things. I don't do the stuff in between mainly because I think it's very hard to sell it uh, to people who think in terms of insurance, you know, people who want the more Pre, predefined payouts that an insurance policy would, would deliver. I mean, ultimately, that's the most flexible way to do it, but I only do one and three. Now, in terms of direct hedging, even that requires a bit of finesse, as we have seen, we've discussed yeah. many times, which you understand as well as I do, which is that the cost of insurance is not static over time. It's not as though you can diversify across thousands of uncorrelated insurance policies and constantly price things in the same way. When the market's afraid, you, you simply cannot go out and buy as much insurance at the same levels as you can when the market is complacent. So it doesn't require some finesse, but assuming that you do apply some reasonable hedge fund style techniques to supplying that, I think that's a very good strategy, just to avoid overspending. You made me think of a friend who worked at a uh, cat bond reinsurance, some sort of hedge fund. So they would be uh, selling like hurricane insurance or re buying the reselling of that hurricane insurance. But she would always be like, oh, we just want a small hurricane. We don't want anyone to get hurt. Don't want a lot of damage. But if, the pre if it can push premiums up a little and the insurance reprices, uh, the odds are still the same, right? Of the next hurricane hitting, the odds don't really change. But when the one hurricane comes through, it pushes up premium. I guess they're allowed to sell it for more because people are fearful. Uh, but the odds yeah. are the same. So it yeah. made a very good living. I think that's a, a good business. We need to analyze at some point. But um, And then another thought there. So I hear everything saying about you personally, but to me it's interesting of the investor side. 
how do you see that split? To me, it's, I think maybe 70, 30, the other way of people just saying, I don't want to do direct hedging. I'm just going to do a add 40% bonds or buy some gold or right. They're, they're thinking sort of hedging, but they're more thinking asset allocation and diversification. So I guess the question is more, do you, how do you tell people there's a need for this direct hedging component instead of just relying on this nebulous concept of asset allocation and diversification? Well, if, if someone issued a guarantee that treasury bonds or government bonds in general would rally um, in every crisis from now on to the end of time, and also that the yield curve would be upward sloping from now until the end of time, there's a strong case to be made for just buying treasuries as a diversifier. But I think if you go back far enough over time, maybe this is a Chris Cole type of thing again, um, you'll find that bonds haven't really provided reliable protection, um, say, over many decades. Maybe since the 80s they have, but since the secular bull market in government debt, but not before that. And if that ever changed, and if you think of the risks purely in terms of where yields are, vis-a-vis -vis where they can go, then this whole idea that, you, that sort of uh, riding that camel until it falls over by diversifying into bonds or coming up with some clever looking scheme using a bunch of fancy math that basically forces you to allocate a lot to bonds may fail. And I worry about what other people are doing in that regard. Was, was that a veiled nod to risk parity? Yeah, it is a, well, not so veiled. Not so veiled as it turns out, okay. Not so veiled, but I mean, I understand why people do risk parity. Um, it looks great in a back test. And if you operate under the assumption that bonds will rally in a flight to quality, fine. It's probably better than hedging, but that is a heroic assumption. Yeah. If bills are globally close to zero. Okay, maybe they can go negative. Maybe you can make some money on roll down. Uh, but at some point with a perfectly flat zero yielding curve, um, the risk has to be asymmetric to the downside, at least for prices. It's kind of from an, I think that's a wise go-to hedge in the medium-term future. So it seems as an investor, the, the calculus is, is the basis risk of those non-guaranteed diversifiers um, greater than the cost basis of doing the direct hedges, right? Yeah. But I'm with you of bonds, especially now when they're yielding nothing. Like in the past, hey, if they're wrong and they don't do a flight to quality, at least I get this yield. But now it's, you know, you, you're just relying on that flight to quality aspect. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where, um, you know, if you had a yield curve, uh, I wrote this in the first book, that where the yield was zero for maturity, zero years to nine years, 364 days, and then the 10-year yield was one basis point, you'd still be able to buy bonds in the sense that you could buy a 10-year bond every so often. And then when it became less than a 10-year bond, it would reprice and you could dump it and then buy another 10-year bond and do it again, which is effectively what the futures do because they have a thing under up the curve. Yeah, so trading the curve is one way to make money without yields being high, but even that becomes increasingly difficult when the short end is pinned at zero or near zero. And the long end is vectoring down in there. And uh, so even that trade eventually gets squashed. Yeah, and even managed futures last year in 19 made money in boons and a bunch of negative yielding debt because it basically got more negative yielding. Um, so that can happen, but it seems an odd bet. So back to uh, options, do you, you know, we're seeing all this talk, which we touched on earlier of like the gamma hedging and Robinhood retail option flow. Do you kind of see this as a golden age of option trading? Like anyone with an internet connection can trade an option. And if, if that's the case, or maybe golden age is the wrong word, but it seems as if there's more people in the world today than ever before that can trade an option. Is that a good thing for you, for market makers, for those people? 
It's not good on average for those people. Um, I think the reason they're trading options isn't just that they're ultra bullish and they want to load up with implied leverage on the upside. It's also because the, the places they're trading through, the platforms they're trading through, probably won't allow them to build significant positions without trading options. So they're kind of forced into it if they really want to make a big return on their investment. Well, and or they offer free stock commissions. You pay commission for option trends. They're incented to uh, push you into options. Yeah, to steer you in there. That's right. And then the, the apps and everything are all gamified of like, have you tried options yet? You know, so there's, there's that component of it as well. But I, I would agree. Like, I don't think it's a net positive for society that a bunch of people are, are trading options and, oh, this is easy. I just buy a call. I don't have to put up much money. The Tesla goes up, cash out. And I feel very bad because some of my favorite finance, um, you know, podcasts, they have commercials. They're interrupted by commercials. Maybe I should get the proper YouTube subscription, but yeah. they're interrupted by commercials where people are making outrageous claims. Oh, yeah. In the middle of a perfectly good, sensible um, show. And That's why we don't have ads. Well, you're a wise man. Yeah. Well, I'm always like, and then, or right, you have some, unless you can control not just who, but the, also the content gets a little dicey. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think it's a net positive for society. I mean, you know, the, the fact that you can trade options with bounded risk doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of risk if you buy a lot of options, right? You can still burn all the premium. And, uh, you know, if you're too aggressive in spending, that can lead to problems as well. And I, I brought this up on our pod talking about this gamma um, phenomenon of if most of these people are losing money, like, is that eventually going to dry up, right? If they're all buying and the dealers are marking them up because they have to protect their risk and they have to make money. In theory, if they're marking them up correctly, uh, then it's just a directional bet that 50-50 at best, right? Um, yeah, it's a negative, negative edge game for the, the buyers. So. Yeah, so those buyers are eventually going to lose money. So does that flow dry up? Is there a never-ending flow of retail that's going to, you know, replace the ones that are losing money? No, no. no. In a word, no. Right. I don't see it. And not without basic income uh, in the U.S. And maybe they need both basic income and option trading income. Like, here's your eight hundred dollar check a month, and then here's your two hundred dollar check a month to buy options. Yeah, you know, it's funny because a lot of people are unwilling to take options in their career discussions, but they're more than happy to make um, bets with negative expected returns in their retail accounts trading options. And that's a bit unfortunate because they can get some of those options in their lives for free. And uh, sure. I feel sad that that's the case. But it's the same. It's like the gamblers, right? If on a craps table, they'll, they'll bet on the worst possible statistical odds because it's a big payoff. It's 12 to one or 21 or whatever, even though the true odds are a hundred to one or they'll do um, in football, they'll bet on a 16 parlay because it's 10 to one odds. But the true odds of that happening are 50 to one. I don't know the numbers exactly off the top of my head, but right. People just, they're willing to do it because it's a small bet for a large return, even though if they, you know, and then the lottery is the ultimate example of that. Right. So I, I put in my dollar and I could win a billion dollars. But I always said, if you played the, would you play the lottery in reverse? If the lottery sent you a dollar every day, but you have a 0. 0.0000 whatever, six chance of eventually they could come and take everything you own away plus that of your ancestors. And everyone, right? You'd say no way. But in theory, mathematically, it has the same expected return, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right, but if, no one would say, yeah. I want to take that dollar every day. Which, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Which brings me to, have you ever been tempted by the dark side, I'll call it, of, of selling options, which is kind of that same. Uh, I have. I've, I've, I've never been an outright seller, but I've done spreads that I've gotten burned on. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was doing calendar spreads in the Euro stocks. And basically, in, this was 2011, and um, the term structure had become very steep. There were all these solvency crisis related issues. And so I had this notion um, of uh, buying 
Um, so these were kind of deferred in the term structure. So I was buying front month options and then selling twice as many um, further out of the money back month options. And um, I got burned because nothing much happened until late in the expiration cycle. And then all of a sudden there was a shank. And uh, even though I was long gamma, I was short Vega effectively and the Vega caused some problems. Um, I was able to block out the risk by just buying some ridiculously low strike puts below, sinking the cost and then taking a moderate loss on the short puts, but not getting, not getting seriously damaged. But yes, I have ventured into the dark side in spreads, but never in uh, leveraged naked shorts. No. And what would you say to the mostly retail crowd that's out there selling those naked, if they're allowed? I don't even know if they're allowed to do that anymore. But I mean, I know regulatory wise, but risk wise. If they're allowed, just don't do it. It's, it's <laughs> worth it. It's just life, life isn't worth that. Uh, you know, the stress is just amazing if you have open-ended risk and you need the market to come back in very short order, that's, you know, it's just simply not worth it. Or just buy and hold Tesla or something, right? Just buy and hold some stocks if you want that risk profile. Yeah, buy penny stocks or something. Or, yeah. or not even, pen, but just the, which comes to me, like if you, everyone's trying to hedge, everyone's trying to do something, if you have this 50-year view, you'd be like, yeah, it goes down, it always comes back up. Right, that's yeah, right. Penny stocks is the wrong example, but yeah, yeah, your your case is a good one. Yeah. But what do you say to that? If people are like, why should I hedge? It it always comes back. It does, but people's uh, tolerance for pain and their ability to keep the position going um, is not indefinite. Right, it's and a it only takes variation of the gambler's ruin type setup. Yeah. Yeah. It only takes one time of it not coming back to, yeah. It could come back 99 times and then that hundredth time you're, you're out, you're done. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you what you think is one of the most commonly misunderstood thing about options, both for retail traders and for professional traders. Uh, there, well, one subtlety I like to talk about is that if you buy a very long dated option, it doesn't matter really if you buy, if it's got a low delta, it doesn't really matter if you buy a call or a put. And uh, unless you take carry and interest rates into account, that's significant. That's, that's something that a lot of people don't get. The other thing is that a lot of people worry about the wrong Greeks for, the, for certain maturities. I don't care about row interest rate sensitivity for a one month option. Right. I don't care too much about it. But I should care a lot about dividend yields and interest rates for longer dated stuff. So, you know, I, I often tell people that if you're trading a one month option versus a one year option, you're actually trading two very different things, even if they're both puts. And so looking along the surface, you've really got a whole like panoply of different strategies embedded in there if you just take the time to take a look at it. The one other thing I'd say is that um, this every dog has its day type message is an important one. Any option strategy is going to have setups that work well for it, even the silliest one. And even the best strategy is going to have gaps, holes in it, situations that won't play out. The question is, do you understand what those scenarios are? And are you playing the right strategy statistically or probabilistically or gambling-wise based on what the market is giving you now? That's what options trading is about. It's a combined, potentially combined directional and vol bet with an emphasis on vol. And so you wanna be doing the right sort of structure given what the market is providing for you. And we, you see that in these Chicago prop firms, you know, option backgrounds of, they just go into those environments that are right for their strategy and they'll step aside or they'll go into other markets where that's right for them. You don't, yeah, don't, that's, don't force it. Yeah, you should never force it. I mean. So for example, we have a VIX replication strategy and um, basically it does well if the VIX flatlines or if it explodes. It doesn't do well if the VIX trends up. But, you know, the bet we're making is that the VIX generally doesn't go up by one or two points every week. It either spikes or it flatlines or it decays. And so if you can create those setups in your strategy uh, or any of your... Um, 
your strategy. That's that's the best you can hope for. And if you play consistently, you have good shot at success. And then I should ask earlier, but so your strategy are you offering one strategy to investors or you let them come in and create a bespoke product? Well, bit of it depends on the mandate. Um, I do, as you as you have mentioned, we do um, sort of classical hedging where we have a somewhat um, uh, constrained strategy of buying downside equity index puts. We do the replication strategies and we also do customized bespoke stuff where if a client wants to hedge a single position or um, has a specific exposure to a currency or something, we can, we can block out the risk efficiently there too. And for international clients, currency risk is very significant. So that's one of the things we have in our arsenal. Uh, and then I, for that break, so if someone has a huge Apple position that's grown tens of millions of dollars or something and comes to you and you'll say, all right, here's how we can protect that. Yeah. That kind of thing. And what, speaking of Apple, what do you think on just as the kind of winner takes all economy and fang is just becoming a larger and larger portion of the indices? Is that an issue for index option pricing or it all gets kind of baked into the prices? And it doesn't matter. What are your thoughts on that? Um, the S and P 500 is still pretty diversified. The Nasdaq less so. Uh, it is a problem. It's definitely a problem because aside from its being a societal problem, which I won't go into, <laughs> um, it just naturally reduces the amount of diversification in the markets. And one of the problems that had been the case, it may still be the case, is people trading a small number of names actively and then just passively going into everything else. That's not a healthy market. There's no relative value really to speak of in a market like that. Um, it's just performance chasing plus passive investing. And in theory, the smaller the basket, the more volatility it would have, right? Less of that smoothing effect. So in theory, you could see as if that becomes more and more of the case, it'll either be under the volatility of the index will be underpriced or it's just going to reflect the volatility of those individual names. Yeah, exactly. Which I'm sure there's tons of strategies out there right now of doing that arb between the, the, uh, the index vol and the single name vol, which brings us full circle to what you used to do at the, uh, back in London. That's a long, yeah. Well, it's been a long, long time since I've been doing that stuff. Great. So I'm going to go through a few of your uh, favorites here to end the pod. So Ooh. favorite marathon location. Uh, Copenhagen or San Sebastian. Ooh, but, San Sebastian. That's the uh, northern coast of Spain there? That's in the Basque country, yeah. Yeah, and that, don't they have like four Michelin star restaurants or something? I think there's a lot of good spots there. Oh, it's fantastic for tapas and the whole thing. It's, it's quite nice. It's a different culture from most of the rest of spain but fantastic i'm gonna go there you can surf there i think too there's some some surfing good restaurants well, i knew how yeah i'm not gonna run a marathon but i'll check out the rest wow, um, and best hotel in your marathon travels uh, i've never stayed at a fantastic hotel on the races but the radisson blue in uh copenhagen is nice all right i like it yeah. um Favorite, uh, well, you have your PhD in chaos theory, so we could do a whole nother pod discussing that. <laughs> My wife's uh, cousin's husband is an artist and sculpt. He's a mathematician, but he's also an artist and sculptor. And he will do mathematical formulas in art form. So you've seen those, those chaos uh, fractals and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, the, attra the Lorenz attraction and that jazz, yeah. Yeah, but he's taken it to another level of like in different formulas instead of just those fractals of like, here's, I'm, I don't know enough to tell you what he's painting or what he's sculpting, but it's quite interesting. Um, and to that's me, a, the, that's, that's above my level of expertise, but yeah, that's interesting. Absolutely. And I was philosophy major. And to me, the further you go in philosophy, the closer you get to math. It might be the same way. The further you go in math, the, the closer you get to philosophy. Yeah, you know, as you get into I logic. Disagree with that. Yeah. Um, so that was a long way of saying favorite mathematician. 
Yeah. Well, I, when I was an undergrad, I liked Cantor because he had all of these different levels of infinity. He's different. There, there could be various sets and they were all infinitely sized, but some were a whole lot bigger than other ones. That blew my mind. That just blew, blew my mind. mind. Okay. Too. He went, uh, he that went, was the precursor for different stages of a crisis, different levels of infinity. All right. Uh, that's far more, more sophisticated than anything. <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so favorite city you've lived in? Uh, when I was a baby, I lived in Geneva, but I don't remember it too well. Uh, London was good. I lived in Chicago for a bit. That was great when I was younger. Um, I might, I'd either go with Chicago or London for All right. very different reasons. Chicago was great back in, when I was there in the late nineties because uh, it was a friendly city to just go around. Yeah, it's, it looks worse on the news. It's still pretty friendly, but it, it's been looking pretty bad on the news here late, lately. Sadly, yeah, yeah. We've got a bit of some tax and finance and pension issues, but we'll take it. A lot of, I think a lot of people just say Chicago to uh, not hurt my feelings, but I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, favorite Star Wars character? Oh, I'll go with Chewbacca. Chewie, all right. Can you, can you do a Chewie? No. <laughs> no. We've had a few. I like it. All right, Harry. Well, thanks so much for your time. Uh, look forward to seeing you in person one of these days when we get a vaccine or can go out, do whatever. But uh, until then, good to see you. Tell people where they can. Uh, you're rather anonymous on the internet, but you don't have Twitter or anything like that. I would, but you know, it's a question of just keeping myself under control. I know you would be great on it. I'd look forward to that. But um, we'll put we'll put the SC website out on the show notes and whatnot. You got thank it. Thank you. Time. You got it, Jeff. All the best. You've been listening to the derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCM Alt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalt.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.